This webinar is co-hosted by CMQCC and CPQCC. I am Courtney Bro, Associate Director of Quality at CPQCC, and we thank you for joining us virtually today. We will be listening to perineal physicians from Northern California who will be sharing their personal experiences with taking care of the Latinx community. We want to recognize that there are different terms that patients and healthcare workers use when they refer to the Latina, Latino, Hispanic population. And for the purpose of our webinar today, we will be using one term, Latinx, throughout our presentation. And one of our presenters, Dr. Carmen Powell, will address the terminology and further recommendations around this in detail in her closing slides. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna go over a couple of webinar logistics and note that everybody is muted upon entry and the chat function has been disabled. We ask that you utilize the Q&A box if you're having technical difficulties and also to submit any questions you have for the presenters. We will answer a select number of these questions relevant to the topics presented during the Q&A portion as time allows at the end of the webinar. The remainder of these questions may be used to inform the topics of future webinars in this series. Also of note, the slides and the webinar recording will be made available on our perinatal programs website shortly after the webinar. And also due to the rapidly changing guidelines around COVID-19, the slides and recording may be taken down after a few weeks. Next slide. Also want to note that the information that's shared in this webinar series and on our resource site serving examples of how hospitals, healthcare workers, and families in California are responding to COVID-19. We understand that each of you is working with a different set of resources and constraints, and that some of these recommendations may not be applicable to your hospital setting. Guidelines and recommendations should be adapted to fit your local needs. And also, as this is a rapidly evolving public health situation, we encourage you to consider the most recently available local health department and CDC guidance when developing your internal protocol. Next slide, please. Now I'm really pleased to share with you our presenters for today. These folks will be sharing their experiences and insight around taking care of our Latinx community. We will close out the webinar as time allows with a Q&A session. And I'd also like to recognize our physician leaders at our California Quality Collaborative and our co-leaders in our COVID webinar planning. Dr. Elliot Main, Medical Director of CMQCC, and Dr. Henry Lee, Chief Medical Officer of CPQCC. Next slide, please. You'll see today's agenda here with this slide, and our speakers will be providing their unique perspectives with caring for their Latinx patients and families. We truly thank them for sharing their experiences with us today. Next slide. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Diana Robles from UCSF, who will kick us off with our presentation today. Diana. Thank you, Courtney. Today's topic is sparked by the health disparities we've been experiencing here in California and across the country with regards to the impact of COVID-19 in our Latinx community. Next slide, please. With public health leaders and frontline health workers sounding the alarm, these disparities have garnered both local and national media attention, as I've highlighted here in this slide. Next slide, please. The extent of this disparity is truly grave, as the California Department of Public Health has been tracking. While Latinx people make up about 39% of the population of California, they are severely overrepresented in the number of cases and deaths due to COVID-19 in the state. Nearly 60% of cases in adults have occurred in the Latinx community and over 70% of children and adolescents who have contracted the virus have been Latinx. Next slide, please. It is important for us to note that our perinatal patient population is not spared from this disparity 
as illustrated in the CDC's National Review of the Incidence of SARS-CoV-2 Infection in Pregnant and Reproductive Aged Women. 46% of pregnant women who tested positive in this national cohort identified as Latinx, with 38% of positive cases identifying as Latinx in the non-pregnant cohort. A reasonable question when faced with these data is to ask why. Why is this disparity so great? It's important for us to note that the magnitude of the pre-existing structural challenges faced by the Latinx community extend beyond our perinatal patient population and exist both inside and outside of our perinatal units. Without our own education and advocacy, these barriers will continue to negatively affect our patients long after the pandemic is behind us. Next slide, please. When we take the time to understand where our Latinx community has been before and during this pandemic, we gain better insight into why they have been disproportionately impacted. As illustrated in this slide, Latinx workers are overrepresented in many frontline occupations in California, alongside other communities of color. Being an essential worker increases your risk of exposure to the virus, and there's varying ability to accommodate adequate PPE and social distancing based on the, your type of employment. Next slide, please. When we think about the importance of social distancing and the ability for infected individuals to safely quarantine at home, we have to take into consideration the nature of the homes of our Latinx community. Nearly half of all multi-generational homes in California are in the Latinx community. These data that I highlight here from the U.S. Census do not capture the crowded living conditions that can be seen in migrant communities and homeless shelters, which we know can increase the risk of virus transmission. How are our community leaders helping multi-generational households and these other crowded environments prevent further spread of the virus? Next slide, please. The Latinx community is also facing a significant proportion of the economic impact of the pandemic, with over 60% of Latinx households reporting loss of employment income since the first shelter-in-place orders were announced. Clearly, the economic challenges are profound across all households, and this can affect a family's ability to adopt protective measures against the pandemic, their ability to obtain testing, or their ability to access and utilize health care. Next slide, please. These are just some of the many systemic challenges that our Latinx community is facing throughout the pandemic and beyond. Our goal for the rest of this talk is to explore in more detail the barriers specific to our perinatal communities and the ways in which we can work to confront these barriers and improve the health of our patient population. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gamboa and Dr. Powell to lead us in the next part of the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Robles. Uh, I'm very excited to be here to present and also share some of our experiences here at Watsonville Community Hospital, addressing the barriers to obstructed care and neonatal and at some actionable items. Next slide. So uh, first, as Dr. Robles highlighted the disparities, we must recognize that this is a public health crisis um, going on across our country. But specifically uh, where this pertains to our experiences, I was actively seeing this disparity take place in my own community here in Santa Cruz County. Um, here, we just wanted to highlight our map. It's a relatively small county uh, where overall we've only had 2,300 cases, but we can see an overwhelming representation here down in Watson in the southern part of the region, as well as an over-representation of over 60% of our cases being in the Hispanic and Latino communities here uh, in Santa Cruz County. So when you start to see this data uh, that's been provided by the CDC, you might want to highlight that there is a disparity going on actively and there are things that you need to really kind of investigate in terms of barriers and ways that you want to combat them. Next slide. Uh, one thing that uh, also when we talk about barriers and structural challenges, we really want to make sure we're classifying it appropriately. So one thing um, that was uh, highlighted earlier in our presentation is thinking about how do these other factors of work 
um, where we live and our communities are exacerbating what we're seeing right now in the COVID-19 crisis. And particularly using the right language of social determinants of health really helps with this conversation. This is just only a short list of some of the things that structurally as well as systemically are impacting our Latinx communities, but also understanding how this may interplay with seeing the higher rates of COVID-19 cases. Next slide, please. Also, we also want to think about our own human factors that we all share across uh, ethnicities and our own uh, cultural experiences, but understanding that some of these human factors can also directly contribute to some of the disparities that we're seeing in terms of access and barriers to care, particularly looking at patient choice and um, current distress of the health system, which really kind of has been undermined during this uh, process of combating COVID-19. Also, the late self-referral or actually knowing when to seek care if there's disruptions in insurance or other things that may impact receiving access to care. Our own health, cultural, societal, uh, and religious beliefs may also contribute to some of our own distrust um, and also belief in this uh, pandemic, and also just our own changes right now as we're adapting to the protective and preventive measures to spread during this time in the pandemic. So really, in order to ensure that we're having an adequate response to this pandemic for all of our communities, particularly those that are marginalized and are Latina X, we want to understand also the cultural differences that may also drive some of our choices in terms of accessing care. Next slide, please. Another area that I uh, directly focus in um, with a lot of the work pertaining to um, when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion in healthcare is also really the underpinnings of bias and systemic inequalities that really disrupt our care. Um, really looking at our own workforce in terms of the diversity um, that can make a difference in terms of how our patients will interact, as well as the persistent racial, ethnic, and cultural incongruity between our physicians and our patients, particularly in our Latina X community that comprise over a third of our population, but yet are fairly underrepresented in our healthcare workforce. Also, we have to highlight the both unconscious and conscious racial biases that we allow to persist in healthcare, and really how do we um, see that interplay with our marginalized and immigrant populations? And then also, do we have access for us as healthcare providers for cultural competency and humility training within our healthcare workforce to combat these biases that persist? And really also when there's adverse social determinants of health and systems of structural racism at play, we can see how all these factors can compound to increasing um, the overrepresentation in our marginalized communities. So really looking at these different factors can also think about um, how we think about our treatment and how that can be varied. And in my next slide, I'll highlight that in some research that's been done in the NICU setting. Next slide, please. So specifically, the study that was done by uh, Dr. Sergrudson and Dr. Prof Profit at Stanford Medicine prior to the pandemic taking place, really was looking at the underpinnings of the health disparities in the NICU setting, as well as some of these barriers. And what was important to highlight in the study is the fact that this is taking a quality improvement lens, but what they were able to do with this uh, study is survey actually patients' experiences in the NICU setting and really asking them in a qualitative survey, how did they feel like their care was received um, during their time? And what was really kind of uh, disheartening to see is that even patients are high highlighting um, um, issues with disparate care, specifically highlighting three themes of neglectful care, uh, judgmental care by staff, and systemic barriers where there may have been uh, a lack of access relating to transportation or housing that may have actually impacted their NICU uh, care. Also, uh, I think when we talk about a Latinx population, we also want to make sure that we address language barriers, because that's something that we as healthcare providers can help to mitigate. And some of my colleagues will um, expound upon that further, as well as being advocates for our patients and ensuring that the care isn't uh, uh, disparate in uh, how they advocate for themselves and their families while in the NICU setting. Next slide, please. And really, these are just like a few uh, examples of some of these barriers that I know myself, as well as other colleagues in the NICU setting have experienced. But during the start of the pandemic, what I found to be very challenging is applying, you know, very broad uh, 
approaches as well as guidance to different clinical care settings. And specifically looking at, um, you know, when guidelines are unclear or rapidly changing and may not be readily applicable to the NICU or nursery that you're providing care in. Um, also restrictions on visitation policies that fall in line with more of adult care, but not really looking at the nuances of the NICU or the neonatal setting for our nurseries. And also what was really kind of critical and disheartening to see in our communities was this disruption of early bonding between mother and the neonate and really how do we combat that and how do we actually provide care that's equitable for all of our patients. Uh, as Dr. Gambella will go into some more of the barriers, I think addressing limited access to testing and the capacity that was needed in communities that were hardest hit was really important to address early on during this pandemic and continue to address, as well as uh, our ability to accommodate and making sure we have adequate infection control to protect both mother and baby uh, during this time. I will pass off to Dr. Gamboa to talk about the rest of the barriers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Um, again, my name is Dr. Christina Gamboa. I'm an OBGYN physician at, who practices at Watsonville Community Hospital and also at our community health center, um, FQHC, um, located in Watsonville on the Central Coast. Um, I'm going to take this time just to discuss the barriers that we've seen specific in our Latinx obstetric population and also just highlighting that a lot of the barriers that we see don't just affect our expecting women on their own, but really does impact the family. And as a Latina myself, we know that when it talks to our own individual care and our well-being, it really does extend beyond ourselves and it includes and must include um, considering those barriers and issues as it relates to our support units. And one of the most you know, impressive issues that we had when the COVID pandemic started was the inavailability of testing. This is something that we saw throughout all communities, not just specific to the Latinx community or our local Santa Cruz community, um, community, but throughout. And the disparities that existed were predominantly seen higher in those who rely heavily on Medicaid or who have a larger uninsured population. The Latinx community is one of the, um, has the lowest rates of medical insurance coverage of all ethnic and racial communities and high, rely heavily on community health services, public health, and free clinics. In the first weeks, days of the pandemic, what we saw was literally the testing um, availability being limited to three tests for a whole day. This required support systems, community centers to really convene quickly to decide how we were going to use this testing, how we were going to communicate with our lo local public health officials to advocate for more testing. And so it really required a lot of communication, flexibility of staffing, and relying on our resources to assure that there was adequate testing. This has significantly improved as the pandemic has reached past a six-month period of existing, but it is something that continuously uh, has been addressed. I'll discuss a little bit more how locally we partnered with our local um, institution and university, the University of California in Santa Cruz to supply testing, but the partnership with a um, laboratory such as the one that they had and community foundations and partners to provide free testing was really important for our community and I know has been the case for several communities throughout California having days where people didn't have to present any insurance status and um, or any documentation for a community that is marginalized, has a large immigrant population is very key and has been something that's important to assure a healthy community. Um, language barriers and barriers to um, literacy levels has also been something that's highly impacted our community and the Latinx community as a whole. 72% of Hispanics remark that there is a non-English language spoken in their household, particularly Spanish, and approximately a third of those report Spanish being their fluent language. In our community, at our health center, we've seen the same. 71% of our patients prefer Spanish as their spoken and written language. And with a subset of that, we have 5% of our Spanish-speaking patients who speak a Mixtec language, a dialect known specifically to a region of Mexico and Oaxaca, in Guerrera, in Puebla, that um, has a large immigrant population into the central coast of California due to our, our large agricultural community. This we can see will also affect several communities throughout the country. Um, in Central America and other parts of Mexico, Mexico, there are similar indigenous languages that are preferred and the only spoken um, language by our Latinx community. So having a knowledge of what the linguistic needs are of our community, where there may be a difference depending on generations um, in the household, 
is extremely important. In that obstetric world, we have a large number of women who speak Mistec, but their partners speak Spanish. And so making sure that patients have the agency and autonomy to speak for themselves and have their appropriate resources is key. Having resources that are multilingual is also very important and having it in a multimedia fashion so that literacy um, levels can be um, obliterated and not necessary is, is important. Consideration of your community's immigration status um, is important for access to care and also for addressing the fear that people may have in terms of utilizing health institutions. Um, in California, all expecting moms have the availability of medical and dental insurance through our Medicaid, also known as Medi-Cal program, but I know this is not the case in other communities. So utilizing those insurance um, plans for women when they're pregnant is important. Also finding opportunities where community centers um, and clinics can apply for presumptive Medi-Cal is important. What we've seen during this COVID pandemic, however, unfortunately, the application has now included information questioning your immigration history and status. So we have seen a decline in the enrollment and being aware of those and change in legislation is key when delivering care to immigrant community. Next slide, please. As Dr. Powell has mentioned, the visitor policies were, have changed tremendously throughout um, the pandemic, comparing them to our pre-pandemic. Um, uh, environment. This has existed throughout the entire country, and I wish to say that our community could do something different, but that's not the unfortunate reality. Having flexibility and what these visitor policies look like is key. Having conversations with patients about why this policy is important for their safety, our health setting safety is important, <clears throat> and using technology such as text messaging to give them notification of how these policy changing has um, evolved is important so that they can have time to prepare for childcare, transportation, and just the mental ability to, um, to adjust. Being conscious of active employment that may be taking place um, while someone's pregnant is important. At the start of our COVID pandemic, it was peak season in our agricultural community here on the Central Coast. April, May is a time where many field workers get ready to pick in the most highly demanding time for the row crops of strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries, and will choose at times to work in their early part of their pregnancy. So being aware of this, having the appropriate education tools so they can keep themselves safe, um, providing facial coverings, partnering with agricultural, um, large agricultural industries and organizations was key for us, and having meetings to um, find ways to limit um, exposure was very important. Recognizing the stigma that can exist and the stress that um, having COVID or having loved ones have COVID is extremely important, particularly as I mentioned, as we work and serve a community that is very family centric. Um, very often in a migrant community and a large immigrant community or where there is limitations to housing, you will find that there is multi-generational housing, but multi multi-family housing where you have many families living in one house. And we see this hold true in our community where you have a young family renting a room out of a, a five room household. And so you can imagine that when one of those members in the house has a positive COVID, needing to disclose that to people that they may not know that well, and or that they have fear that there may be retaliation by asking them to leave um, can be very stressful. And having support services such as behavioral health and counseling via telehealth um, and telephonic services has been extremely crucial and important. Next slide. And these are just some references that Dr. Powell and I have used to compose um, our part of this portion of the presentation. And from here, I'll turn it on to, over to Dr. Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, and good afternoon. Um, Murphy's Law, as soon as the uh, webinar started, my screen has frozen twice. Uh, so I'm hoping I am being heard uh, and I appreciate uh, your patience. Uh, next slide. Thank you for allowing me to share my experience uh, as a clinician and community member here in the Salinas Valley. Uh, this is information from the California Department of Public Health and published in the LA Times. We've been alluding to this from uh, the previous three speakers with the cumulative cases um, in California as of last week. And as you can see, obviously the Latinos 
or Latinx population uh, may have made up 61 percent uh, of the COVID positive cases in the state and approximately 49 percent of the deaths in the state as well. And again, to put this in perspective, and this was mentioned by Deanna, uh, the Latinx population in California makes up only about 38 to 39 percent. So this is really a major issue that's that's occurring. Next slide. This is additional information from the Department of Public Health and again published in the LA Times, uh, includes California counties ranked by new cases in the past seven days. And this is last week's data, but I just looked at it again this morning and it's very similar. The vast majority of these counties are rural. And again, this is something that um, uh, most people think that of in the urban areas in terms of the number of cases, but if you look at it per 100,000 residents, you'll see that these pop these counties are not what you would consider the most populous counties. For example, Monterey County, which is circled in red, uh, is in the Central Coast. And that's where I reside and I provide clinical coverage, was ranked in the top three to four counties of new COVID cases per 100,000. Uh, this morning, I believe it was number two and number three. And this is, this is despite a population of approximately only 450,000. Latinx makes up 58% of this population. Of note, most of these cases are concentrated in the Salinas Valley area as opposed to the peninsula of Monterey County. And then in the right-hand side is the Vermont Oxford Network um, data for the NICU at Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital. And as you can see, Latinx makes up 80 to 85% of the small babies in our unit. And essentially, this is what makes up not only our well baby population, as well as just our labor and delivery population. So we primarily serve this, this community. Next slide, please. Now, these are recent pictures of essential farm workers in Monterey County taken last month, obviously during the COVID-19 pandemic, and despite the wildfire smoke, and this brings back, what well, this brings to my attention, what's happening up in Napa Valley as of this, this morning. These essential workers have no choice but to plow on through the smoke to put food into stores and onto our tables. The top left picture was close to my home um, and during the river fire, which can be seen burning in the background. I recall driving to the hospital one morning and that's actually before we were evacuated, and seeing hundreds of workers um, having to endure these elements. Um, fortunately, Monterey County uh, has attempted to distribute thousands of N95 masks and have secured orders for additional uh, 100,000 as well. Next slide. So therefore, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the tremendous challenges that we face um, in every aspect of our society, but particularly in our Latinx uh, communities throughout California and our perinatal population on the Central Coast. Now we have an algorithm in place for our pregnant mothers. Uh, common educational issues uh, related to the pandemic include simple processes, for example, as, met, as seen on this slide uh, uh, on the left-hand side and how to wear a mask to should gloves be worn for everyday errands. It's, but it's so important to have this information available in a bilingual format as illustrated in these two examples. Next slide. Probably even more important is to have healthcare professionals who are not only familiar and influential in the community, but willing to participate in, in these forms of social network educational activities, which could impact a large number of our population. Our pregnant mothers, for example, are being asked to quarantine for 14 days prior to their due date. And Christina just mentioned some of the obstacles that um, or challenges that 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 creates but in any event um, when we have these members of our families living in small housing units uh, or large members of family members reciting as previously previously discussed it is great to have examples of uh, of these educational tools that become available however I'm going to address the issue of the digital divide on my last slide next slide now, a health system in the Salinas Valley is also providing COVID-19 education to the agricultural uh, community uh, during the early part of the pandemic where elective surgeries and clinics were canceled. Uh, instead of furloughing uh, these nurses and other providers, many of the bilingual employees were given the opportunity to switch roles and provide education out in the fields or processing plants. Influenza education was recently added. Next slide. 
Now, this program faces several obstacles, uh, including literacy uh, from the uh, workers, uh, skepticism and lack of trust toward employees, employer or regulatory bodies. But currently, almost 11.8 thousand workers have participated uh, in this uh, program. And here is a list of the agricultural companies and number of workers from the Salinas Valley as of August 2020. Next slide. Now in Monterey and Southern Santa Cruz County, and, and, and my two uh, speakers in front of me uh, spoke about the uh, services in, in Santa Cruz County, we have five hospitals. And on the top is Watsonville Community Hospital, which has OB coverage provided by Salud para la Gente and pediatric hospitalist programs from Lucille Packer Children's Hospital from Stanford. Um, and then in Salinas there are two hospitals that have perinatal services, which do deliver high risk pregnancies. They're, one is associated with Lucille Packard and the other with UC San Francisco. And those are within the urban city uh, of Salinas. There are two other hospitals in the Southern and in the uh, Southern part of Monterey County and one also in Peninsula. But uh, the maternal fetal medicine service and community NICUs are primarily located within the city of Salinas and has a combined 27 beds available. Next slide. Now, if a higher level of care is required, these centers have to transport either both the, the maternal or the neonatal um, uh, transports to three Bay Area, Bay Area regional centers by virtue of our joint venture and our affiliation. The COVID-19 pandemic accentuates uh, the transport issues faced by our general and perinatal community. The local community facilities in Modern Gray and Santa Cruz County, especially L&D and NICUs, were really not designed for the needs of the COVID positive patient as per um, the American uh, uh, ACOG or the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine or the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, recommendations. And accommodations have been made to convert these L&Ds and mother baby units uh, uh, suitable for isolation and negative pressure rooms. But these issues may be further accentuated if the newborn requires neonatal care. Next slide. Now we have transported COVID-19 positive mothers and or their babies. Typically the babies could be cared for at the community level, but the lack of isolation and negative pressure rooms in a high census NICU makes it difficult. Therefore, if transported out, these mothers or babies face the parental or family support separation, the distance and travel time, um, especially in traffic, the availability of low cost housing um, at the regional centers. Uh, even though we do know Ronald McDonald House exists, they're often filled. And it further accentuates the issues of these transports. Now COVID-19 visitor restriction to one or both parents only also causes uh, severe barriers because it separates um, the parents from the family support group as well. So all these obstacles must be tackled by our community. Make, and, and if you think about it, this 80 to 100 mile uh, travel uh, and the two to three hour travel time, oftentimes is done daily by our families who have to then come back. The father will have to come back and work in the area. So it is an incredible obstacle to face. Next slide. Now, our NICU was fortunate that uh, with grant funding that was um, obtained over a year and a half ago, we actually invested in webcam systems, allowing parents, family members, including siblings and grandparents, access to real-time videos of their babies using smartphone, tablets, or computers. For many of our families, this has turned out to be fortuitous, specifically during the COVID-19 visitor restrictions. But again, we are assuming that our community have internet access, and I will address that in a moment. At least the wire net internet access is available within the hospitals and our consents are available in Spanish. Next slide. And addressing this language barrier, it is possible there is technology that exists in many of the community and regional centers throughout California uh, for our limited English speaking um, uh, patients. And this even includes the deaf and hard of hearing. The alternative to utilizing available bilingual staff uh, may be limited for several reasons, which I, I can't get into, but we may during the questions and answer. But this on-demand system also has shown here may have some limitation as well. Next slide. The best solution to address this language barrier is really to have competent healthcare providers who are multilingual and willing to engage in our communities. But as we know, 
Uh, that involves the subject of diversity in higher education, uh, specifically in healthcare uh, area, and that's a, a topic in itself that can last several hours. Next slide. More importantly, uh, one cannot assume that all monolingual Latinx speak only Spanish, and uh, Christina uh, highlighted this in, in her uh, uh, last slide. For example, in the Mexican state of Oaxaca, which is circled here, um, there are various groups of registered indigenous uh, pueblos that maintain much of their culture and identity, including their unique language and dialect. A percentage of the agricultural and other essential workers in our community and throughout the state are actually pa part are, are from this part of Mexico or also uh, from the Yucatan uh, Peninsula or Central America. But in Oaxaca, it is estimated that maybe up to 11 to 20 percent do not speak Spanish, and I, I have encountered this in my patient population. However, it's also my experience in California that there's the vast majority do um, are multilingual, speak Spanish, or have other family members that can help translate as well. But it, it, it can present to be a credible barrier. And then finally, next slide. Now, many of the approaches to overcome these obstacles require the use of internet or Wi-Fi access. Uh, for example, I mentioned Facebook educational videos and access to other digital real-time um, videos, and even uh, the use of uh, internet, I'm sorry, uh, virtual healthcare appointments as well. However, the reality is that a significant digital divide exists in our community and throughout the state. This was captured in a single photo that I'm sure many of you out there saw uh, it made its rounds on social media, uh, local, regional, and even the national news, uh, shining a light on the digital divide that has long existed in the United States. These are two children outside of Taco Bell in Salinas, California. So this is actually in my community. Uh, they're using the free Wi-Fi to do schoolwork. The local school district, after this came out, you can imagine, then provided internet hotspot to, to the families. Um, and ordered more uh, uh, families from that school district um, and raised even $130,000 to provide um, internet access. But the reality is our digital divide is real and COVID-19 has brought awareness to digital inequality, impacting healthcare um, updates, uh, educational uh, edu uh, tools that are available, the virtual healthcare appointments that um, some of us are probably have experienced through, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, and obviously the digital video NICU, you know, we tell the parents that you can see your baby, but they tell me, well, we don't have internet access at home, and um, it, it's just heartbreaking. So the educators, administrators, healthcare providers are experiencing firsthand the lack of, the, of this access throughout our Latinx and other populations. So I will now turn this over again to presentation to my OB colleague and Dr. Christina Gamboa. Thank you, Dr. Castro. And I think that's just to highlight, you know, the importance of our community partnerships and keeping our services and looking to the community for the knowledge of what services are needed, um, because really our community will always have the answers. Next slide. So I'm just going to highlight a couple examples of community partnerships we've seen in our local community and at our, um, our, my, our clinic, Salud Pala Gente, that we've been um, fortunate to partner with. And there, my disclaimer with this is that there's many similar efforts throughout California and the country. And so modeling and picking what community partnerships are most appropriate for your community really does, um, will look different depending on where you're at. But there are several great examples that have been evolving as this pandemic has continued to um, progress. One thing that we, um, we did and identified in the early stages of COVID was partnering with our county health department and other um, physicians throughout the community. I myself work at community, community health center, fairly qualified health center, um, but there are still several private practices in our community that did not have the same infrastructure and support to adapt to this growing pandemic. And so including them in the conversations, our partners in the northern part of our county um, was key. In the beginning stages, we had meetings daily, seven days a week, at times multiple meetings a day, to try to figure out what the resources were that were available and what, what the need was. The, Santa Cruz County extends along the coastline of California, and there's a northern part of it and the southern part of it. And what we were finding pretty quickly is that the inequities 
and the overburdening of COVID was predominantly in our southern part of our county. That, then, that knowledge and having communications as a county as a whole really then helped help us um, rely on our partners to make sure we had adequate PPE and testing and that the appropriate messaging was going to the appropriate areas. With the partnership with the University of California Santa Cruz Molecular Diagnostic Lab, the uh, testing availability dramatically improved. This was an effort that was made and supported by our local community foundation through philanthropy. They funded this testing, continue to still fund this testing and support their technology from the university. And we are now able to perform um, several hundreds of testing a day with quick turnaround time, which has been very important. Next slide. Having partners from the community that didn't just involve our healthcare settings and healthcare um, providers was key. We were finding as time went on that there was community advocates, community organizers, um, people involved in education, in civics and politics, all who were very interested in seeing the, how this burdened our, our communities and were reaching out to make new collaborations that didn't exist prior to COVID. One of the groups that um, combined and joined during COVID was Save Lives Pajaro Valley Community Group. And this um, composes people from our community health center, um, superintendents of the school, different civic participants and organizers and nonprofits. And as a collaboration, the key and the um, goal has been to really create one unified message that was appropriate for our community. As we all know, and as health consumers ourselves, the messaging that has existed through COVID has been very um, rambunctious to say the least. It's been very, very varying. It's been hard at times to navigate. And so if you look, try to put ourselves and look through the lens of what our vulnerable communities had to face, it was even, uh, even more so. And so having one message that was unified that could be disseminated to several different commute, micro communities was really important. Similarly, having collaborations with um, nonprofits such as our Thriving Immigrant Collaborative um, was key for us. They've been able to provide forums and involve the community itself and members um, to provide education, including our healthcare provider uh, on topics and have a Q&A form so patients had the actual access um, in live space and forum to ask questions that pertain to them and their health. Similarly, forums have existed for housing, has existed for um, education, and they continue and have been very key in our communities. Partnering with our local school district has also been key to um, supply, uh, supply services for our families, particularly as there was discussions about possibly reentering back into the classroom, which has been postponed um, and delayed until um, an unknown time, but having that network has been very important to disseminate healthcare information to them and to use their network. Next slide. Partnerships have really been key for addressing what I call family essentials, living essentials, being able to have appropriate amount of food for a household, secure housing, and financial support. As we talked about, when a member has COVID or they are asked to quarantine or isolate for a lot of families that is money that is not able to be made because they're not able to go to work and a lot of our families do not have the availability to use other um, support services or systems do not have savings and so really do rely on their living wage to be able to supply for their family and so with the um, food banks that have existed prior to COVID um, but have been able to receive more donations during COVID, families were able to present to their local food distribution, distribution sites weekly to get a good amount of food and healthy food. Um, you know, it's a paradox that in a large agricultural community, some of the largest food deserts are in our agricultural communities and, and in the Latinx community. There are several images taken throughout the news on social media with line distributions extending lengths of hundreds and hundreds of cars um, and so really want to highlight how these the support for just supporting basic living and free essentials has been key to keep our communities healthy and safe also providing financial relief with a, with philanthropy and through programs such as what we have locally um, called undocu fund has been 
important in our local community and DocuFund has, and through um, distribution from our clinic, we've been able to provide over $1.5 million um, since our, since the start of COVID. So that's been very important. And having partnerships throughout um, the communities has been key. Just wanted to give recognition to that. And from here, I'll turn it over to Dr. Powell um, to go ahead and present the last topic of our webinar. Um, thank you. Um, so we uh, covered uh, a lot uh, in this short hour, and I just wanted to end with some closing thoughts. And first, you know, I should disclose that I am Black and African American, and, you know, to be invited to talk about this um, really speaks to just the uh, wealth of this community and the work that we do, but also the fact that, you know, for myself, uh, Santa Cruz, Watsonville, this is a home. And also understand, you know, in our own understanding of the cultures and the differences um, between us as providers, as practitioners, and also our patients, I think it's important that we always have a lens of a practicing and cultural humility, um, practicing to understand our communities better, to give them the best care possible. And so I bring this up because um, for myself in preparation for this talk, I wanted to make sure that I was, uh, you know, using the right terminology. And I had a conversation with my mentor, Dr. Fernando Mendoza, who helped with some of the slides today as well, and his amazing work in advocacy for the Latino, Latino X and Hispanic communities. But he also let me know that you know, over just the history of this community kind of really kind of being the foundation for our country, uh, the state of California, really kind of the terminology just emerged recently in the 1970s and 1990s. Um, and really kind of is up to individuals to really kind of make that definition for themselves. And for us as healthcare providers really to encourage our community and to ask, how would you like to be addressed as opposed to just giving a single label? Um, and so for just our own understanding, really taking that critical lens is important. And I had this quote just from him just um, regarding this article that was recently published in Pews because this has been a national discussion ongoing um, in terms of just using the term Latinx really kind of allows for um, gender expression as well. Um, but really of the community, only 3% have actually used this term. So really kind of like this is a good insight. Um, but at the end of the day, one of the issues is that you don't want to disenfranchise people by having us tell them what they should be called. And I think that uh, for Latinos, Latina X, Hispanic community, it's more so becoming aware of what you can do with this terminology and how you want to define yourself. And really thinking for most groups of color, my included, um, that, you know, in the future, he highlights his two grandchildren, they may, you know, want to decide what they want to be called, and hopefully we can give people that agency and that access to do so. Next slide. Uh, also, um, it's been amazing to be a part of this uh, webinar series with CMQCC and CPQCC, but I think it's also really great to see the uh, spread of our community um, hospitals are engaged in this work, but also leveraging our access and strategic support with our academic institutions as well, uh, specifically looking at how do we best bridge uh, our communities together to build a wealth of a network that really serves our communities, as well as how do we help these communities bridge some of those gaps and some of the facilitators looking at, you know, how do we improve our interpreter services? Um, as Dr. Castro mentioned, how do we improve really the technology and telehealth and addressing that through grant funding or other projects? And I think it's also important that when we talk about health disparities, that we're actively also addressing opportunities for basic clinical and policy research to really mitigate these barriers and really also involving um, ourselves in education and training to ensure that we are uh, building up a diverse workforce that has this lens of cultural humility that we talk about. Um, one specific example is the work of Dr. Mendoza through the COE DME office and they also look at pipeline uh, leadership training and their own kind of social, social justice curriculum um, in this vein. And you really can't talk about really um, supporting the Latina X community without talking about advocacy. And when we talk about community partnerships, that's another way of us practicing our advocacy and really getting us all involved in this conversation as well. Next slide. 
Um, these are just two examples of some ongoing research um, in uh, healthcare policy and really how this can um, really drive change in our communities and really improve health, uh, specifically looking at the immigration policy lab that's looking at uh, DACA uh, for our uh, patients, particularly for our children and our mothers, but also how do we address uh, that disparate access to care and Medicare um, for these populations, as well as looking at um, March of Dimes and their work uh, for a uh, equitable maternal health coalition that's been formed to specifically ensure that we have safe, affordable, sustainable, and really equitable access to health care and advance, you know, the maternal and also neonatal care um, in these un oftentimes marginalized communities. Next slide. Uh, also, UCSF has also done ongoing work uh, with a priority study. So this is a national registry uh, to really look at pregnancy during coronavirus and our outcomes and how we're actually uh, uh, addressing this in our um, Black, Latino, uh, Native uh, populations, but really kind of without having this data, we really don't know if we're really doing an effective work. So I think it's important that as we look at this as um, community providers, that we also tap into these resources and really kind of expand the uh, potential for us really providing equitable care. Next slide. And so I will leave this with some, um, I like to say take home points. I think there are many uh, to be learned during this webinar and I look forward to some of the questions um, after our presentation, but really in all of our perinatal units, we must be aware and provide multilingual, trilingual and culturally relevant resources to dispel any misinformation, but also to improve our care during this COVID-19 pandemic. Also assessing and addressing the needs of our marginalized and most vulnerable populations to combat health disparities. We also must work and collaborate together. I have some ideas of some potential projects already to really mitigate structural and systemic barriers in our prayer and needle units. Also engaging in advocacy efforts um, um, and looking at our community-based partnerships and how do we really build that strategic support for our Latina ex patients and families? How do we educate ourselves and our colleagues when we talk about structural determinants of health, bias, and structural and systemic racism in healthcare? And then also how do we find those linkages and networks with our academic healthcare centers with our community healthcare systems to provide a robust systematic and evidence-based care to our most underserved communities? So with that, I will uh, close uh, for our, oh, most importantly, I think it's really important that we think about our um, advocacy also through voting. Um, we have a very, um, you know, a close election coming, but also looking at, you know, the local elections, because I think that really drives our policies and what um, care we're able to deliver locally within our own counties as well. So make sure you vote in the upcoming election, and I'll pass it along. Wow, thank you, Carmen, for uh, getting us off on that great, great finish. First of all, we'd like to thank Diana, Christina, Carmen, and Robert. We are so grateful for your time and care today. Uh, we know uh, the efforts that are going in around the state, nationally and internationally, uh, to care for people. So we are so grateful for your time. There's one question that's actually come in that I think uh, would be wonderful if one of our uh, presenters, if everyone can go live, first of all, could everyone, if you have the potential to go ahead and show your video again, that would be great. The one question, is there a, a public perinatal dashboard? I am unaware of that, and I am wondering if... Uh, if any of our physicians know of such a such a uh, dashboard in the state or nationally. So hi, I'm Vienna. Um, so the, one of the second to last slide, or one of the last slides that Dr. Powell shared, was, was the live dashboard that's part of the priority study that is also capturing um, a lot of particularly the prenatal community. And that's the only live dashboard that I am aware of um, nationally that because this study does um, want to include both birthing people and um, their, their, their neonates. Valerie, excuse um, me, and so Diana, this is part Valerie, can you go back to that slide while she's speaking? I think that perfect. Thank you, Diana. Yes. Continue. So um, priority.ucsf.edu. Um, this is a, a, 
multi-institutional study, um, and the website is housed uh, on UCSF servers. Um, there's also the Birth Justice Corps, which is also a, a, a a study, part of the study groups. Um, it's a different group of researchers that are kind of expanding particularly the questions of reproductive health equity around um, COVID. And so the CDC has also published um, the some of the initial data nationally. Um, but this also just highlights the difficulty of answering this question for this particular, for our perinatal communities in, in, in specifically. And so part of, um, we can't talk about health equity without talking about the importance of including these communities in our research um, as well. Um, I also want to point out that uh, Dr. Mitchell just submitted, thank you, Connie, from the California Department of Public Health. Thank you for attending today, first of all that she noted that the CDPH is participating in a CDC COVID and pregnancy registry, which will soon be public. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I really want to thank Ms. Frost, Patricia, for, um, then for, for coming in with that question. Very, very uh, applicable. So thank you. We're going to go ahead and begin to tie up um, the end of our webinar. We want to go ahead. I'll, I'll go over the CME info in just a moment. We want to thank all of our attendees for joining this seventh webinar in our series. Uh, next slide. One more. Perfect. Uh, we want to go ahead and just remind everybody that we know that all facilities, clinics, hospitals are uh, may not apply, right? These guidelines or recommendations may not apply please go ahead and keep current with your local health department and obviously the CDC. Next slide. Thank you, Valerie. So this is our newer, we created it this spring, our California perinatal programs.org website. Please go to the website and view the really excellent resources we have on here. You can see we've got some updates, not only for California hospitals, we include all of our webinars that we've created all seven um, have been on here at one point. The slide decks, uh, depending on the content of the webinar, um, are remain on the website for a few weeks. We've actually continued to house a few of those for public viewing uh, because of the content of them. We have sample hospital resources, like I said, and then very importantly, organizational recommendations. So it really is kind of a one-stop shop for, uh, for the situation. Last slide. Valerie, thank you. This is your claim CME slide. There is CME associated. And I want to remind all our ends in the state of California that you can utilize CME for your license renewal. Um, it's a quick, uh, quick find. Uh, it is CME at Stanford. Um, and you see the website there. The number or the code for our webinar today is 38932. Everybody, participants, speakers, caregivers throughout the state nationally and internationally thank you so much for attending please spread the word that this will be housed on that website we'd love for more folks to to do this webinar this panel was stellar and the enthusiasm and the spirit that came across today in the care they have for this community and really for all communities was really quite rewarding. so thank you everybody it's just about one o'clock we wish everyone a good day and send good thoughts to the entire state uh, for fighting these fires. Thank you, everybody. Be well. <laughs>